for next Saturday. So this will come a little bit full circle as I continue with the uh, message today. Um, I honestly, I, I almost don't even need to share after Jeff's song because Jeff actually encapsulated most of what I want to say in his offering today. Uh, but I will, since I prepared, continue on. So let's read uh, a few verses. Uh, we'll start in 1 Kings 19. 1 Kings 19, we'll just read one verse in 1 Kings 19, verse 18. First Kings 19, 18 says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And then uh, go over to Ezra, just a few books later. Ezra chapter 1, the first couple of verses of Ezra chapter 1. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth the Lord God of heaven has given to me, and he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? May his God be with him. Now let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel, he is God, which is in Jerusalem. And then we'll read a couple of verses in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16, verse 18. Uh, I'm sorry, verse, uh, yeah, verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And then one final verse as an introduction. Revelation chapter 1. So Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we are so thankful that we can be before you today. What a joy it is to be in your presence. Lord, there's nowhere else we want to be. And now as we open up your word, we believe and have faith that your word is living and active. And we pray that your word would, uh, would pierce through our hearts, Lord, that we would know you more today. Open up the eyes of our hearts, Lord. We want to know you. We want to know what you're doing, what you're after, what your purpose is for us. So we commit to you this time and uh, just say that, Lord, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. So... Um, in the last couple of years, I know some of you uh, are newer here in our midst, but in the last couple of years, I've shared several times uh, a word related to days of shaking. And if you remember, if you go back a little bit over two years, I shared about the necessity of having deep roots in days of shaking. I continued on with that theme, and it developed into seeing the Lord as our one thing, as it says there in Psalm 27, one thing do I seek. We continued on earlier this year. We had a theme about seeking first the kingdom of God. And we had a few sharings about seeking him first before all things, both in quality and in time, uh, that really our heart needs to be focused on the Lord during these days. Uh, we continued on that theme and, and talked about how we need to be careful that weights don't hold us down. And that was a word from Hebrews 12, thinking about how, you know, there's sin that besets us from running the race. But weights are a little bit more subtle, and they hold us back from really being after that one thing. And then uh, even this last month, I shared about hiding in Christ, our stronghold. And these are all words that were shared 
in this season that we've been going through of considering how the Lord has been shaking things happening around us to have that firm foundation to come back to and to have confidence in who He is and who we are and how we can stand in Him in these difficult days. And maybe a little bit of a pivot today in sharing a word of encouragement about how we can stand for the Lord as his testimony in these days of shaking. So I begin with this, this thought that Jesus says uh, there in Matthew 16. He says, I will build my church. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that the Lord says something, I believe it. I have confidence that when he says something, he will do it. He doesn't do it in part. He doesn't do it um, uh, just uh, enough to get by. But when he says something, he does it to completion. It's a, there's a fullness behind everything that the Lord says. And we can be fully persuaded that when he says something, he means it and he will do it. And a few weeks ago, I shared a little bit of open sharing about that thought in Romans 4, where uh, I talked about how Abraham was fully persuaded that what God said he would do. And this is the same truth for us. We can be fully persuaded that when God says something, he will do it. So this is a, a word of encouragement, really, because when he says, I will build my church, he actually means that. He will build his church. Um, and that's because he is what? He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He knows the end from the beginning. Um, and he's been building his church since it was born there at Pentecost, back in Acts 2. We're not going to go through the whole history right now. But he's been building his church. So what I want to share today is along those lines of the building of his church. But I'm going to frame it this way today. And this is my, my theme. The Lord always preserves a remnant to bear the testimony of Jesus. From generation to generation, the Lord always preserves a remnant to hold up the testimony of Jesus from generation to generation. And this word today really is in preparation for our walking tour of Manhattan next week, where we're going to continue on that thought of how the Lord has preserved a remnant for himself, even here in Manhattan. So we'll talk a little bit about this idea of the remnant in the Bible. We'll talk a little bit about testimony today. And then we'll get a little bit into history. So I, I don't know where Zion's at in his history class, but this is like a little bit of maybe honors European history. I don't think we're getting into AP yet, but um, a little bit of a little touch of history today. Um, okay, so remnant. What is a remnant? For some of us, this might be a familiar word. Um, it's not, not a word that I think most Christians uh, talk about or have teaching on, this idea of the remnant. Uh, but very simply, a remnant is a smaller part of a larger group. It's left behind. Uh, it's, something, it's a portion of a whole. Uh, and we see this idea of the remnant woven throughout Scripture. If you go back, uh, one of the first times, if you see the word mentioned, is in uh, Genesis 45 where uh, this is the story of Joseph. And, of course, we know the story of Joseph where Joseph is sold into slavery and he's in Egypt and the Lord raises him up to be uh, prime minister there in Egypt and then his brothers come back and they're all freaking out because they think that Joseph is going to kill them because they sold him out and sold him into slavery. You know this whole story. But then what Joseph says here in Genesis 45, 7, he says, And God sent me before you, to preserve a remnant for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So that idea of remnant is something that's been preserved, that the Lord is doing to preserve a testimony for himself. And we see that there in Joseph. And then, of course, we've been studying Isaiah. We took a, we've taken a break over the summer of studying Isaiah. But in Isaiah, there's a lot of talk of the remnant. I'll just read a couple of verses. In Isaiah chapter 10, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God, 
For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. And then just a few chapters later in Isaiah 37, and this is actually from the section that I taught on uh, about two years ago in this idea of the deep roots. And Isaiah 37, just read two more verses here. And the remnant who have escaped of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant, and those who escape from Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts, will do this. And of course, the remnant is also spoken about in the New Testament as well. I'll just read one verse so you believe me. I know you guys, you always want proof. I'm a prosecutor. I give proof. Here's, here's your evidence. In uh, Romans 11, 5, it says, Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So there's this idea of the remnant. Now, the Bible is full of stories of remnant people. So you're probably, you're, you're, you're probably already thinking of all these different examples in the Bible where there's a remnant that's left behind. The first one I think about is Noah. Think of how like Noah is in the midst of all these people. People are just living lives and there's just corruption and chaos and turmoil on the earth. And the Lord preserves a remnant of Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And that remnant is saved on the ark. Uh, I read at the beginning there that verse from 1 Kings 19 where it talks about Elijah. Now, what happens with Elijah? Elijah is a prophet. He has this epic moment just a chapter before this verse that I read where all the prophets of Baal are up on Mount Carmel and they prepare their offering and Elijah prepares his offering and they can't get the fire to burn, but then he... Uh, pours water upon water on it. It's a total mess. It's impossible. The Lord sends fire down, consumes the whole offering. It's amazing. He kills 450 prophets of Baal. It's a really like gruesome, crazy moment. And then right after that, at this real high point, then he gets all depressed because he's like, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one on the whole, all of Israel that believes in you, God, because Jezebel is after him and wants to kill him. Um, but then the Lord gives him this encouragement. I have not, uh, there are 7,000 that I have preserved that have not bowed the knee to Baal, right? There's a remnant, even though it seems like there's just corruption in the land, there's still a remnant. I read those verses in Ezra, the beginning of Ezra. We know the story. Of course, there's the, the children of Israel all taken into captivity. And then at some point, God ordains that Cyrus will have this decree to send people back. But even though there are millions of Israelites that are in captivity, only about 50,000 return to Israel. And Zerubbabel uh, is one that was part of the leaders that takes them back. Of course, we know the stories of Nehemiah and there are others. Um, but there's just a remnant. There's a huge group, but only actually a small portion returned to the Promised Land. Um, we can go in the New Testament. And just give a couple examples to get this idea of the remnant. I think of Simeon and Anna. Think about when, when Jesus was born, there was Simeon and Anna that, were, uh, that met Jesus as a baby. So we'll just, I think there's a couple of verses there would be good to read. Uh, in Luke 2, 25, it says, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. So Simeon was somebody who, despite all of the Jewish activity that was happening, he still was waiting for the consolation of Israel. He was waiting for the Messiah. He had a heart there, despite all the other activity happening. And then Anna, just a few verses later, in verse 37, this is... Um, uh, Anna, this is Luke 2, 37. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. So Simeon and Anna, they're waiting. They're waiting for something. Even though, again, there's much 
activity happening, but there was something more, and they knew that there was something more that they needed to be focused on. If you go through the, the book of uh, the, the chapter Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11 is like a whole story in this hall of faith of all those that were preserved as a remnant. They stood for the Lord no matter what. I think of uh, the 120 in the upper room. I think of those as a remnant of a larger group that were waiting uh, on the Lord. And then, of course, we know in Revelation 12, we'll read that verse 2, Revelation chapter 12, Uh, verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to death. I think that, that idea of these overcomers, these who were standing as real disciples of the Lord, um, were that remnant, the, that remnant called for him. So what's, I ask you, so this is my question. As I, I'm thinking about all these different stories, okay, these are interesting stories, we know these stories, we're familiar with them. What's the common thread through all these different remnant stories. What's the thing that all of them have in common is what I've been pondering on. And actually very simply, it seems to be that what they share in common just didn't make sense. It just didn't make sense to really follow the Lord. Let's think about it for a second. Look at Noah. The guy is building a boat in the desert. Okay, God tells him, build this gigantic boat in the desert. If you haven't been to the Noah's Ark in Kentucky, you should go and see it. Because when you see it, you'll, it'll be even more obvious how bizarre it was that Noah built this boat in a desert. It's gigantic. It's the largest wooden structure in the world today is the, is the ark. It's huge. You can see it from really far off. He's building a boat in the desert. It doesn't make any sense. Everyone else is marrying and giving in marriage. They're just living their lives. But Noah was faithful to the Lord. It didn't make sense. Think about Elijah. Elijah, he has this kind of mountaintop experience, no pun intended. Um, he then is now being sought by Jezebel. This evil Jezebel wants to assassinate him. Okay? He can just let it go. Say, all right, Jezebel, you win. Don't kill me. I, I don't want to die. And just like stop there. I mean, it didn't make sense for Elijah to go on with the Lord. You think about the Jews who were in captivity there. They've been there in captivity for decades, right? They have a system. They must have, of course, they have their synagogue system where they have these little neighborhood churches all over, as it were, uh, there in, in captivity. They have jobs and lives. Why would you move thousands of miles? You can imagine, like, now picking up your family and moving thousands of miles to an unknown land that you're not aware of, that you don't know what to expect, that's barren, and, 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 and who knows what's lurking for you along the way. It doesn't make sense. Think about Simeon or Anna. Anna is old. She's 84 years old. Why wait? Why wait all the way until you're 84 years old? Move on with your life, right? The Messiah hasn't come yet, right? Go do something else. You can imagine like how much time she's spending in the temple day in and day out waiting for the Lord, waiting for the Lord, worshiping him. It just doesn't make sense. Look at the 120 who are in the upper room, right? If you, now, 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 mind you, these 120 in the upper room, there were 500 that saw Jesus resurrected, right? If you go in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about when, this is one of the examples where it's talking about like proof of the resurrection Paul gives, and it says that 500 saw Jesus resurrected at once. Now, that's, that's kind of crazy to me to think that 500 saw Jesus resurrected, but there's only 120 in the upper room. Why? What happened to the 380? They saw, I mean, they not only, I mean, you have to imagine, they probably saw Jesus when he was, before he died, performing miracles, healing people, then they saw Jesus resurrected. Wouldn't, you'd think that that would capture you and you say, that's it, I saw Jesus resurrected. I'm going to go with him no matter what, all the way to the end. But yet somehow there was only 120 that were in that upper room waiting on the Lord. 
Um, and what was it for those 380? Was it the, the Roman, they were afraid of the Romans and the oppression of the government and uh, the system that was around them? Was it fear of the Jews? Of course, you know, in John 20, it talks about they were uh, hiding for fear of the Jews. Was it that? We don't know exactly, but these 120 remain faithful despite the cost. Then, of course, you have there in Revelation 12, this example where they loved their lives unto, they did not love their lives unto death. Now, that doesn't make sense, right? So we see this as, as related to the remnant all throughout Scripture, how there are people who are preserved for the Lord despite... Now, I think this is a word that we can relate to being here in Manhattan. For many of us, it's like, wow, it doesn't make sense to live here. One of the facts you'll find out on the history tour is that things were expensive in Manhattan then as they are now. You could buy a cow for half price in Boston as you can in New York City, even in the 1600s. It doesn't make sense to live here in Manhattan, okay? Um, and we can go on and on about that. A lot of things don't make sense. It's difficult. We get it to be here. But the Lord preserves a remnant, regardless of circumstances, regardless of generation, regardless of any merit or anything that we think is special about any of these people. They were just regular people who were faithful to the Lord. Um, and it brings me back to that word that we can have confidence in. The Lord says, I will build my church. And we know that that word is in response to Peter seeing by revelation that Jesus is the Christ. So there's something related to seeing Christ for who he is and then this building of the church. So there's something that all of these remnant people saw. They saw something of the Lord. And because they saw him, they were willing at all costs to go with him no matter what it took all the way to the end. And that's kind of this picture of the remnant. Now today, the church ought to be a remnant for him, a people that's preserved for him as his body, as his bride. Unfortunately, uh, we don't see that. We see a lot of what's wrong with the church. A lot of Christendom in a larger picture does not seem to be that wholehearted, single-hearted pursuit of the Lord Jesus in that way. Um, but the Lord, nevertheless, uh, preserves a remnant from generation to generation. And there's something of a testimony. Why does the Lord preserve a remnant? What's the purpose? Why? You might say, all right, this is, okay, the Lord, maybe just in his sovereignty, does this? Sure, in his sovereignty, he preserves a remnant. But why? Why would he preserve a remnant from generation to generation? Can't he just you know, start with a, a new people, right? Just, you know, these people are no good. We'll just wipe them out and start with a new people. And then they'll be totally for me and uh, even sinless. We'll make them perfect, right? He can, he can do anything he wants, right? Why does he preserve a remnant from generation to generation? I think it's because he wants, to, he wants people on earth to hold up his testimony, his name, and glorify his name on the earth. We know in, you can go through scripture where it talks about from even in Exodus how all those plagues were happening to bring glory unto Jesus' name. And there's this idea through scripture, and we've been even seeing this in touches as we studied through Isaiah, how the Lord, his name will be glorified from generation to generation. What, okay, so my question then becomes, what is testimony? What's testimony? What's well, you know, what is it? We, we talked about there at Revelation 1, it says the testimony of Jesus. What is testimony? Um, testimony is a public declaration of truth. It's a public declaration of truth. It's not a private declaration of truth. It's actually a public declaration of truth. Um, witnesses bring forth testimony. Um, if a witness doesn't come forth, then there's no testimony. So a lot of times, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm a prosecutor. So a lot of times we have witnesses to crimes, but a witness has no value unless they actually provide testimony. It's interesting to have a witness. It's nice to know that maybe um, someone's saying someone did something, but unless they actually come forward and say it, 
then there's no accountability. There's no kind of completion to whatever it is that we're trying to resolve uh, in the investigation. A witness must come forth. So there's something of testimony actually being borne out, being held out, um, held out to others. Um, testimony includes what is being said. Okay, so that's part of the testimony is what is actually said, the words. Testimony includes how it's being said, right? Because that makes a huge difference in what the testimony looks like. And it's not just what's being said and how it's being said, but it's actually the character of the one who's saying it makes a huge difference in the value of the testimony. Um, I think about it uh, in this way. So in my, my day job, my Monday through Friday, 9 to 5, uh, I will stand uh, on a case. Like I say, I have a case. There's a crime happens. There's a case that follows it. And what I do when I go to court is I speak to the judge. I'm on the record now. It's a whole courtroom scene. And I introduce myself like this. Raymond Valerio for the people of the state of New York. That's the, that's the way that I introduce myself in court. I represent the people of the state of New York. All of you New Yorkers, not you, people in Jersey, you don't count. You're out. <laughs> Everyone in New York. Um, I represent the people of the state of New York. Now, at first, when you first start saying that as a, as a new prosecutor, you realize the weightiness of what you're saying. It's a big deal. Wow, this is not just my case or my office's case. I actually, I'm, do, I'm trying to stand on behalf of all the people in New York State and what is in the best interest of the people of the state of New York. And there's weight behind that and gravity there and authority there. And it's easy over time to make that just a thing that you say. And I think that the same thing can happen for us as we try to stand as a testimony for the Lord is that we don't appreciate the weightiness of what it means to bear the name of Jesus. This name is higher than any other name. And, and one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus as Lord. And it's our role to hold up his name on this earth. If you're wondering what your purpose is, that is your purpose. To hold up the name of Jesus. And not only does it have gravity, but there's authority behind it too. We don't just say it. It's not just some light thing that we just say willy-nilly. There's something that has authority in the name of Jesus, right? So, you I mean, we pray in the name of, there's a reason why we pray in the name of Jesus because there's power in the name. There's reality in the name. There's life in the name of Jesus. So we stand in the name of Jesus. Now, that just doesn't happen as an individual, but as a church, we stand in the name of Jesus. And we, as we gather together, are called to hold up this testimony of Jesus together. Now, we have just a tiny responsibility. We're this small little assembly in Manhattan. We have this little responsibility to hold up the testimony, but we better hold it up, Amen. okay? Because that is our responsibility. Um, and our testimony is what? The hymn that we sang. That is the testimony of Jesus. Now, we sang many, many verses there in that hymn, Jesus only, Jesus ever, Jesus all in all we sing. That is our testimony. Jesus only. Christ is all and in all. That is our testimony. So that when, let's say a newcomer comes for the first time, okay, we have some newcomers here today, what ought they to see when they come for the first time? Jesus. They should see Jesus in, in us as individuals, in us as a corporate body. We are his body. So Christ should be seen as we gather together. Um, let me try to put it another way, just to try to make it uh, very real to what we've been studying. We've been studying over the summer Proverbs, right? We've been studying Proverbs. We've had about six weeks of studying Proverbs. Proverbs is this wonderful book in the Bible where it's explaining how we live the Christian life, okay? But one thing that we should notice as we're studying Proverbs is that each of the traits or, or characteristics that we're talking about are exemplified in Jesus, okay? Think about it. We talked about uh, alcohol and sober-mindedness, right? Look at Jesus. He was, 
he had the right attitude. He was always in the right frame of mind and was never kind of off because he had, uh, had strayed away in his body in any way. We talked about happiness and joy. And we know it talks about in, in John 15 where he talks about, I pray for you that my joy may be in you and your joy will be full. And we see the joy of Jesus. You get, there's, there's that moment in The Chosen where you have to watch it. There's a moment in The Chosen where uh, Sammy talked about the guy, Peter and, and, uh, and the guys fishing in the water. And then all of a sudden, Jesus gets all these fish to come and fill up the nets. And the nets are almost breaking. And you see, this is, like my, this is my favorite moment in the entire series. You see Jesus on shore, and he has a smile from ear to ear because he knows that they're caught. They saw Jesus. That was it. They saw Jesus. And that was it. From then on, they would become fishers of men. That joy, that joy in Jesus. We talked about the tongue. And of course, we think about the tongue. Jesus only said what the Father spoke to him. Everything that he said, there was no idle word. There was no word spoken in the wrong way or not in the right time. He always said the right thing at the right moment. Sometimes people ask him a question. He didn't answer the question. He asked another question in response, right? He always had the right way in his speech. We talked about friendship. Jesus is that friend that sticks closer than a brother, right? There's no one more close than Jesus. We, 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 there's another hymn. We can sing, I have a friend, right? We know we found that friend in Jesus. We talked about generosity last week. And, of course, Jesus, that perfect example of not only giving of himself in touching people while he was on the earth, but dying for us and giving his entire life so that we may live. So as we're going through Proverbs, we're seeing all these, these character traits are not just so that we become, it's not like a self-help study in being better Christians. It's so that we have the character of Jesus in us so that we then reflect Jesus and that Jesus only is our message. And now we're holding up the testimony of Jesus by living out all of these character traits as we're studying them in Proverbs. Don't just look at Proverbs as just like some, this is a good way to live. We're studying Proverbs so that we see more of Jesus and that Jesus is seen more in our lives. And then we testify of him. And it's seen in our coworkers, in our family, in our friends, in our people on the subway when they bump into you, all these different things, the character of Jesus is seen. Now, I, 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 I hope you're excited. To me, this is exciting that we actually have a purpose here and that God chooses us. People who have no particular reason to be chosen, but yet God says, I choose you, and I choose you, and I choose you, and I choose you, and you're mine. You're mine. And I have a purpose for you is to stand for me for the time that I give you, the short time, this dot that we have on earth, stand for me. And then he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant in eternity. This is our purpose now. Now, it's a high calling. So it's, it's exciting, but it's also kind of sobering too to think about this high calling that we have. Um, and this is where we kind of get in a little bit of history now. So many have come before us and have seen this high calling and have lived it out. Uh, and most of them have risked their lives to bear the testimony of Jesus. Uh, especially those that came to New York in the 1600s. So we'll just talk about those for a moment. They went against the grain of the institutional Catholic Church that was persecuting all different denominations of Protestants all throughout Europe. Um, because these, these Protestant believers we're saying that the source of spiritual authority is Christ. Not, it's not man-made. It's Christ. Christ only. So you can go through, and believe me, Matt Graham has like a 13-part series on church history. Listen to it on uh, uh, Christian Testimony Ministry website. I can't, I'm giving you the 30,000-foot, five-minute version, okay? This is, the, this is the cliff notes of the cliff notes of church history to get you here. You'll hear names like the Waldensians. They believed in the priesthood of all believers. You may wonder, you come here, and, you know, if you've never been in a meeting like this before, uh, this is very different than many other Christian meetings. 
And one thing that the Waldensians saw that I think we're trying to live out is this idea of the priesthood of all believers, which means that Cameron, who's not an ordained minister, can come up and open up the time today with a word that's living from the Lord and help usher us into worship. Sammy, who looks nothing like a professional minister, um, can get up and share that. And, and, and me, just a guy who has a regular job who somehow has some portion to play in the body of Christ. This is, and then all of us actually today have an opportunity to actually act as priests and offer up incense unto him through our worship, through our prayers, through our singing and offerings unto him. This is priesthood of all believers. So this is something that was recovered uh, in one way by the Waldensians, but they were persecuted for that, okay? Because the institutional church said, no, it needs to be only these formal priests that can do these roles. It can't be just regular lay people. There's so many names. Uh, John Wycliffe, Huss, Luther, Zwingli, Calvin. Um, all, a lot of these things are leading up to maybe you, did you learn, Zion, did you learn about the 30 years war yet? 1618 to 1648? You'll learn about it someday. You're going to know about this. You're going to be in class someday. And you're going to know the answers. Teachers, how do you know this? and he'll have an opportunity to testify to the Lord. Um, okay, so there's the Thirty Years' War. It's a religious war in the 1600s, and it's pushing persecuted believers, pushing, pushing them, and they're being attracted, actually, to the Netherlands. Has anyone been to the Netherlands before? Anyone been to the Netherlands before? Okay, so the Netherlands, the Dutch, um, were tolerant. They accepted persecuted Christians from all over Europe. Um, and I can give you a name of some of the persecuted Christian groups. Baptists, Anabaptists. So Anabaptists are those who believed in adult baptism. Uh, Familists, Mennonites, Calvinists, Lutherans, singing Quakers, ranting Quakers, Sabbatarians, anti-Sabbatarians, independents, even Jews. Um, and they were all kind of, a lot of them were moving to the Netherlands because the Netherlands accepted them there. Even actually, the, the Dutch were really amazing. The Dutch also went to Taiwan and, um, shared, and, and started to spread the gospel in Taiwan. In fact, actually, Tianan Young's son's name, Zeeland, is part of a port in western Taiwan, Zealandia, um, which is a place where the Dutch kind of invaded. It's a whole other story there. But anyway. Um, uh, but the Dutch were trying to have this Christian influence around the world. Now, as a result of all of these persecuted Christians all over Europe ending up in the Netherlands, when the opportunity came, the, they were, they, no, this, is a, this is an age of exploration. So there are you know, England, Portugal, Spain, Netherlands. They're sending out ships all around the world. They want to find you know, a route to, to tra trading partners. They were looking for business, basically. So... They're, they're looking for a shorter way to India and to China. Um, but some ended up in the New World here. And the Dutch ended up on the island of Manhattan. And this is about 1620s-ish, OK? Uh, actually, Henry Hudson had come earlier. In fact, actually, we celebrated a few years ago, 1609, Henry Hudson sailed up the Hudson River, which is why it got its name. So that's 400, over 400 years ago. But the Dutch tried to settle here in lower Manhattan, all the way in the bottom of Manhattan. The bottom tip of Manhattan is where the, the, these early Dutch settlers came. But most of the boats that came over early were filled with persecuted Christians. And they came to New York because they were looking for an opportunity to stand for the kingdom of God without persecution, to have freedom of religion and freedom of faith. And, and actually establish the kingdom of God here in the new world um, without state intervention. And from there, there are early groups, and we'll talk about them, Huguenots, Walloons, other groups that came here early, very early on in the 1600s, um, stood for the Lord despite the difficulty that it was to, to, to change and, and move to a new land. Um, but then that continued on from generation to generation. If you go into the 1700s, you probably know the name Jonathan Edwards. 
you know, Jonathan Edwards, he's famous for his, his, particularly one message where he says, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Okay, but Jonathan Edwards spent time in Manhattan and served in a small Presbyterian church in the 1700s. And that was before, right before the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening happened. Um, if you continue on, uh, in the 1800s here in New York City, right down on Fulton Street, it was a block away from where our old meeting place was. In 1857, there was a revival that started here in Manhattan and swept through the country, a revival of turning back to the Lord. It started with just a simple noontime prayer meeting. Um, so I just want to, it's just a taste, just a little taste of how from generation to generation, the Lord is preserving a remnant. So I just want to end with a couple, like, maybe some practical thoughts for us about, you know, maybe what that looks like now, today, for us. Um, and, and how can, so I guess my question is this, how can we be part of his remnant today? I think our heart's cry is we, we want to be part of his remnant. We don't want to just be left behind living just comfortable lives, uh, here in New York City. Why, uh, how can we be part of the remnant? And I think there are three things that are, are simple to say, but I think much more difficult to actually live out. Uh, for us to just chew on, and this might be just the beginning thought of this, that we can chew on this more. Uh, so three, three thoughts. One, as we've seen in all these different examples that we gave, to be part of that remnant, we have to count the cost. There's a cost to being the remnant. It's a, it's a cost, whether it's to our comfort or to our own ambitions and dreams, there's a cost to it. Uh, of course, I think Abe a few weeks ago shared on Philippians 3 where Paul was saying he counted all things lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, right? So Paul saw that nothing else, no matter all of, I mean, Paul had not just a resume, he had a curriculum vitae, okay? I, I deal with expert witnesses a lot. He, you know, he had like one of those mega pages of, you know, what do they say? What do they say? Like one page resume? Is that still like a thing? Your resume should be one page? Okay. At some point, you cross over from a resume to a curriculum vitae, and then it can be as long as you want. I've seen an expert have a 30-page CV because he's had over 200 publications. He's like the most well-known DNA expert in the world. Like, okay, that's like Paul. Paul is that guy, okay? He had everything, but he counted all for loss because he was all in for the Lord. So there's a cost involved. Again, easier said than done. And I think the Lord is constantly speaking to each one of our hearts about what needs to be given to him so that we can be all in for him. That's number one. Number two, we need to have single-hearted devotion. Now, on Thursday night in prayer meeting, I know Cameron mentioned something that was prayed uh, during prayer meeting on Thursday, but there was another word that was shared from 1 Corinthians 7 uh, during prayer meeting that is exactly what I wanted to share today about this idea of being single-hearted. In uh, 1 Corinthians 7, let me just get it right here. Okay, uh, verse like 28, 29, it's like this whole section there in the middle of 1 Corinthians 7, uh, talking about marriage, whether you should marry or not, but it says, do... But even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such will, I ha will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. But this I say, brethren, the time is short, so that from now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Those who buy as though they did not possess. And those who use this world as not misusing it. In other words, what he's saying is, he, he, no matter what your state is, you got to be all in for the Lord. Single-hearted devotion for the Lord. Now, does that mean that we forget about our wives? <laughs> of course not. If, if, if you're forgetting about your wife, you're not, you're not having devotion to the Lord because we have responsibility at home to our spouses, to our children, and we should be faithful at work. But there's something about having that single-mindedness throughout all these different parts of life, whether it's in our marriage or our family raising or our work or whatever it is. There's a single-heartedness that's needed. And I'll just give one, and, okay, that's two. Three, simplicity of devotion. Simplicity. I'll, I'll share just a quick story from Acts chapter 3 and 4. You don't have to turn there. You know the story. Uh, there's a, a, a lame man 
who is brought to the temple every day, okay, and he's laid down at the beautiful gate. And Peter and John are on their way by, and he's asking for alms. He's asking for something. And Peter says to him, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And then he gets up and walks. And then there's like this, this stirring and everyone's going wild because this guy who's lame is healed. And then all the religious authorities are all upset. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, everyone's upset. And then um, you get here to Acts 4. So now, whereas Paul was a guy who had the resume, uh, now let's see what happens in this picture of Peter and John. Verse 13, Acts 4, 13, it says, Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's it. That's their testimony. They had been with Jesus. So when, so it wasn't because they, they were uneducated, they were untrained, they had no resume, they had nothing special, but they had Jesus. So they didn't have anything special, but they actually had the only special thing. They had Jesus. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Now, when we stand in this world, that is our pinnacle testimony. That when people see us, they say, Chet has been with Jesus. Kathy has been with Jesus. That's it. When we raise our children and our children look to us, they say, you know what? Dad has been with Jesus. We want our children to love the Lord, to go on with the Lord. Amen. What do they need to see? Amen. They need to see that you have been with Jesus. Amen. It's not just a thing that we do. They go on with the Lord and we, they see we have been with Jesus. So simplicity of testimony, just being with him, spending time with him, getting to know him, simplicity of devotion. And then I'll just say one more thing. To be part of the remnant today, we have to see our absolute need for the Holy Spirit. You know, in Zechariah it says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Amen. We can come up with, you know, we're moving to a new place and we've had some sharings about it. We're on our way to a new location. We're going to have a storefront, you know, ground floor, and we're going to have a million ideas about how to use the space, what we should do, how we should make it look, how we can attract people in. We're going to have all these different ideas, okay? But let none of our ideas stand. It, it, if, if, if it's us, it will come to failure and problems and difficulty. But if we are totally led by the Holy Spirit in total submission to Him and say, Lord, please, Spirit, lead us into what you would have us do, how you would use this place, how we can be a remnant to testify of you as a corporate body in this city, then have your way. Not, we decrease, he increases. And then we can really stand as a remnant testimony in this city. Amen. Lord, thank you that we can uh, uh, just come before you this afternoon. We're humbled in one way when we think that you would even call us to be part of this remnant, to stand as a testimony for you. Uh, but we're also excited, Lord. We know that uh, we're searching for meaning. We're searching for purpose. We're wondering why we're even in this city, in the season that we're here. Um, but we're, we're encouraged that you say that you will build your church. And we're thankful, Lord, that you have called us to be part of that church, yeah. that we can stand for you in this city. Uh, so we pray, Lord, that not just as individuals, but as a corporate body, that we can see by revelation what it means to be this remnant, what it means to testify of you, and that we can stand faithful all the way to the end. So we, we, we need you, Lord. We can't do this on our own or our own strength. We're in total dependence on you. And we say, Lord, have your way amongst us. In Jesus' name we pray.